We invited Dr. Rob Johnstone as our keynote speaker today. He is a true leader in the guided pathway efforts across the nation. In the program, you'll find his official biography. We want to highlight a few extra accomplishments. Uh, working with the NCII organization, which is the National Center for Inquiry and Improvement, Dr. Johnstone authored a significant report on guided pathways demystified, exploring 10 commonly asked questions about implementing pathways. It was so popular that he wrote a sequel called Guided Pathways Demystified 2, <laughs> addressing 10 new questions as the movement gains momentum. I will continue. Uh, Dr. Johnson has presented at many conferences throughout the nation, highlighting the specific concerns that guided pathways will address, including giving students too many choices, not having clear information readily available, having institutional barriers that keep students from com completing, and more. Furthermore, he is the project lead for California Guided Pathway Project, and Long Beach City College is one of the 20 colleges involved with that project. Dr. Johnston is engaging, he's funny, relevant, uh, poignant, and always a breath of fresh Hawaiian air. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, Dr. Johnston. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm very glad to have the next two hours to work, talk to you about that. Is, what, no? Next two hours, not good. I was thinking it would be hard to get this down to two hours. Now, there's, I would actually, I have like 45 minutes, so that's good. Um, look, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We do really serious work at the colleges. You, have, you can read my bio. I will talk about this picture briefly. I usually have about five to ten minutes of stand-up comedy at the start of any keynote, but I can't, I don't have enough time for that today. There's too much to do, but I'm just going to do a little bit on this picture. Um, where I look like Jack Nicholson from The Shining. This actually happened. This happened at an event in Texas where Dr. Davis uh, Jenkins from the Community College Research Center, one of the, he's referred often to as the father of guided pathways, and I'm the weird uncle. Um, but Davis is doing a presentation. They get a wonderful picture of him in his sartorial splendor and just like looking like that East Coast academic. And then Kay McClenny from SESI and the American Association of Community College is looking really brilliant and wise up there. She's got her hand up like this. And then they got the picture of me all right next to each other looking like the guy from The Shining. And I'm like, that's good. It's good that I have a brand. I'm actually really glad, by the way, I wore that Hawaiian shirt on Tuesday in Wisconsin. I didn't wear it again here, so I got that going for me. Um, look, I, I, I want to also thank all the speakers who were up here before me. I mean, an inspirational message to you. I got about 45 minutes with you, and I've learned over the last five years of doing this work, I've done about 300 of these in the last five years. I spend about 200 days a year on the road, mostly outside California, actually. Um, 265,000 air miles last year, which was good. Um, and I do this all over the country. I do it, yeah, I make a living at it, but I'm, you're gonna feel that I'm really passionate about this. And we've learned from doing the Guided Pathways Movement, I don't have a lot of time to go through the arc of the story, although I do think it's important to know it did not just drop out of the sky. There's a 10-year story. It feels like if you're you, it feels like it dropped out of the sky. I've got a whole shtick on that that I can do, but I don't have time to do it today. Know that there's been a progression to here, right? It's been something that's happened over time. I learned, and I was on the early parts of that movement with Completion by Design, the first national project, and I got asked to do keynotes like this a lot from, say, 2013 to now. And in those first three or four years, we did a lot of keynotes where we talked about the mechanics of guided pathways. What is it? What might it look like? And I realized, looking back at it now, that was a horrible mistake. Because we didn't talk enough about the why. About the underpinnings of the foundation for this work. Why it's the, what, what is the problem that we have that Guided Passage is trying to help us solve? And that I'm going to spend about a little over half of my time on today. And I'm going to try to make the case that I, by the way, agree with the folks who talk to you about the crisis that's in front of you at Long Beach City College, the financial crisis. I am a social psychologist by education. I have a doctorate in social psychology from the University of Oregon. Go psychology, Michelle and I are good friends. Um, I'm gonna talk to you, go ducks too, nice. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit briefly, cognitive dissonance, right? What's cognitive dissonance say? If we have external motivations for doing things, it's gonna be weaker. And when you run into problems, you can, you're, gonna you're gonna kind of stop where you're going. 
Um, I believe that you're going to work on things that are going to help you with the financial side of your crisis. I'm going to make the case for the next half hour that the real crisis is that you have thousands of students who aren't meeting their goals at here at Long Beach and at other places. Tens of thousands of students, hundreds of thousands of students if you go around this country. And disproportionately, the students who aren't meeting their goals are low-income students and students of color. This is a social justice issue and it's an equity issue. And this has to be the reason you do this work. You cannot do this work because you're part of a project or because your president, who's great, came from a college who did guided pathways, or because Davis Jenkins wrote a book, or because there's money from the chancellor's office, or because some bozo in a Hawaiian shirt standing in front of you, right? <laughs> you got to do this because you fundamentally think there's a problem we have that not enough students complete, and that matters, and disproportionately the students don't complete. We care about all our students. I agree, we care about 100% of our students. But I'm going to show you in a second some data. Community colleges are the last, first, in many cases, last opportunity particularly for low-income students and students of color. And those are the very students we have the hardest time getting to completion. I'm going to make the case this is about social justice and equity. I will talk a little bit about the mechanics of guided pathways. We don't have a lot of time to go into it. But the first thing I want to do, actually, to switch to the poll, sir, is I'm going to, uh, there's the overview. Take out your phones. This is the thing you don't usually do in a presentation like this. You're supposed to silence your phones. Take them out and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and you're gonna enter the code ROB110, so ROB110, slido.com, you see it on the left side there, ROB110, then you're gonna answer this multiple choice question. The question is, which of the following statements best represents your view of why more students don't complete college? Is it A, 90% student issues, 10% issues colleges control, B, 70% student issues, 30% issues colleges control. C, 50-50. D, 30-70, student and college control. Or E, 10% student, 90% issues that colleges control. And we're going to let this come up here for a couple seconds. It's a nice big room, so we'll get some trends soon. I'm a data guy. I worked in IR for a while, so I love watching the chart move. It's awesome, like seeing the chart move. If I was a true research methodologist, I'd hide the results until they were done so no one's affected by what people before them have said, but not that big of a methodologist. All right, so what are we seeing here? Early trends, we got 85 of you already in. We're seeing the dominant answers are D and C. 50% issues students, 50% college, and 30% students, 70% issues colleges control. This is fascinating, by the way. How many faculty do I have in the room by hands? How many classified staff? How many administrators? You know what's really interesting about this is, keep, keep responding, is when I do this survey, this is a question really about agency, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. When I have rooms that are primarily faculty, the dominant response to this question at college tends to be somewhere between C and B. That it's more student issues and less issues to college control. If I have more classified administrators, it tends to be between C and D, who see it more in the, in the role of, now by the way, there's not a right answer to this. I don't have some magic right answer. What I'm actually doing this for is to see how you feel about how much control you have over the reason students don't complete. Because if you all answered A, and by the way, I don't think the people who answer A are necessarily wrong. This is really about how you view the student experience and how much control you have over it. If you answer A, there's no reason to have a conversation about change. And I will also observe that we've spent most of the last 50 years acting as if A is the answer. The issue in the unit of change is how do we fix students, right? We talk about the achievement gap. We talk about student achievement. The achievement gap, by the way, almost directly implies the problems the student and not the system, the structure, or the culture, right? Gloria Ladson Billings, an equity writer, like wanted to reframe that term achievement gap into educational debt that the system has accrued because these outcomes are the way they are. Because there's a 10 or 15 or 20 point difference between Latino and white students. That's a great reframing. And by the way, she was right. Because we have examples of colleges, I also won't have time to go into today, who've eliminated the so-called achievement gap based on this work. Georgia State University being the one who's done this the most, with a very pop population very similar to ours. So I don't have a lot of time to go into nuance on this, but what does this mean to me? This means that you believe you have some control over the reasons more students don't complete. 
It's a belief that's going to be really important as you go through this work. This work is going to get hard, right? It's not going to be easy. You're doing it under difficult circumstances from a financial standpoint. I, by the way, have about a 45-minute rant on performance funding that I'm not going to do. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big fan. I understand the thinking behind it. People want to see more completions. They want to see, I'm going to show you why those completions are so important. We already knew they were important. They're particularly important to community college students. I get the theory. The practice of it results in a lot of scurrying around trying to fo follow a formula. Right? That's my 30 second version of the rant. I have a much longer version of that rant. <laughs> but if you're doing this for those reasons, you're going to do the minimum and you're going to work on the formula, not on the outcomes. The key to this is the outcomes and having our students be the ones who win at the end of this. So look at this for a second. Anyone who's in anything, so 97% of you believe that at least one third of the reasons more students don't complete college is in our control. And by the way, this is from a big room, probably the most agency I've ever seen. You've got, like, wow, that's really far away. 80% um, <laughs> of you believe it's at least 50% of the reason more students don't, think about that a second. You believe you have in your control. Now, I didn't ask if it was funding neutral. I get all of that, right? But we believe we have more in our control. This is great, great news, because you're going to need that going forward. Let's go back to the slides. Thank you for your efforts there. Um, all right, quick overview. We did the poll questions. I'm going to talk now for about 10 minutes about social justice and economic mobility and some data on why this is such an important problem. By the way, just for a second, and I'm going to include myself in the survey. How many of you came to Long Beach City College or to work in a community college in general, primarily to work on social justice or economic mobility? Be honest with yourself. That's about the right, my hand's not up either, by the way. It's not why I came. Put, go ahead and put them down. Thank you for you guys for coming here for that reason. It doesn't mean the rest of us did anything wrong. It means we loved our discipline or it was a good job near us. Or for my case, I was just finishing a strategic consulting job in industry. I was tired of industry. I went to the dot-com bust. And I looked on monster.com and found a job at Foothill in institutional research and said, I wonder what institutional research is. But I, I don't know what that is. I don't know. I have a PhD. I taught statistics. We can figure this out. That's pretty much what that was. That was about as deep as I got. And the only other reason I looked at it is my dad played football there before he went and played football at San Jose State. And the only thing I remember about Foothill is my dad told me in a freshman game there, he face masked OJ Simpson three times. I'm not sure how that plays into race and equity relations going forward, but it was a powerful memory. So I didn't come here for these reasons either. But why are they the reasons I still work doing what I do and travel 200 days a year, 250,000 miles? Because this work matters. We, you work in the sector of maybe of all education, but the very least of higher education that has the most potential to be a bridge to a family sustaining wage, to be a bridge out of intergenerational poverty. Right? The system of higher education in this country that we use is about 800 years old. Who is it designed for, by the way? The rich offspring of the ruling elite. Now, if we go to the European, by the way, there's a debate on where it started, whether it's in North Africa or Asia or in Europe. But in all of those situations, it was for the rich offspring of the ruling elite, almost exclusively male. We democratized higher education in the U.S. in the mid-20th century. What did we do? Mid Land grants at mid 19th century. I think that was the first thing we did, which got some ass. Mid 20th century, GI Bill. GI Bill. So th millions of students come back from World War II, literally millions, come back from World War II. By the way, wasn't that diverse at the first? That didn't work great at access for underrepresented minority populations at first. It got there. But we opened the door to millions of students who had never been in higher education before, right? So we hit a home run on access. We got better. We had to do one more thing, by the way. Because we didn't have room for those students in those land-grant universities, what do we do next? Us. When did Long Beach City College start? So you're one of the few, right? Most community colleges in this country started between the 50s and the 70s in response to this huge shift in who's going to higher education. So we hit a home run in the 20th section on access. The problem is the model still works very well today if you have unlimited time and unlimited resources and good social capital. It works great in those three circumstances. It still does. Look at the data on success rate and go, not even just going to college, but success rates in college by income level at the same preparation level. And you'll find 30, 40 point differences between high income and low income students. Right, so it works great. You know what it doesn't work great for? First time in college students, low income students. And I'm gonna make the case in a second 
that's disproportionately correlated with students of color. Not because there's anything wrong with the students or their families, but because of economic and social situations that have caused these inequities, right? I know I'm in California. I did this in Wisconsin, and I got much less nodding heads on Tuesday when I did this. <laughs> I have to catch myself. I'm all over the country. Occasionally, I'm in like rural Arkansas, and I'm like, okay, I can't do that. It's not going to work here. It's so good to be back in California. All right. I am going to show you some quick metrics that, are, that kind of are used to kind of establish a baseline for where Long Beach is now as we move forward. I just want to preview that. They're not going to be good. And I don't go at this, but by the way, I have to talk to colleges who are above the averages that I show and say you're still not good. Because we all want to look relatively how we do versus other colleges. I'm going to ask you to look at this from an absolute sense. Is it okay that this many students aren't reaching this bar? You're going to want to look at the, you're also going to want to explain away why other colleges are higher. I get this. I, I'm, I'm a data guy. I know what happens. Right? You see a chart and you say, I, oh, that's Foothill. They work in Los Altos Hills, which is true because Foothill's in Los Altos Hills. Right? I get that. Right? But we're going to talk about that data a little bit. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the data, but I want to show it to you. And then I'm going to introduce you to key transformations and guided pathways. And it'll, that'll be good because I've got about an hour and 50 minutes left, so that should all go fine. Um, <laughs> I do have a category that may grow, which is leave behind slides we won't get to. Uh, you heard I wrote a couple of papers, Guided Pathways Demystified 1 and 2. These were in response to being in front of rooms like this and being on the ground. I do these keynotes, but I also work deeply with colleges on implementation. I've started something more formal on that called, actually, this next one, the A2I2 cohort model, where I, it's called Agency, Attitude, and Intent. I needed an acronym. Agency, you can see how important I think agency is. Attitude, colleges have to have the right attitude that they can work on this. Well, what this really is about is not talking about things. It's about intensive implementation. Right? We have a long history of tinkering on the margins and somehow magically thinking that that's going to produce 30-point increases in completion rates. What's the definition of insanity? <laughs> Same thing over and over again, expect a different result. And just before we go much farther, you never had a different group of students than you have now in terms of preparation. Maybe you did from the 20s to the 50s. Right? We have roughly dealt with the same preparedness level of student populations for years. You've had 20% who are going to succeed no matter what you do. You have 15% who are probably not going to succeed no matter what you do. It's always been about the 65 in the middle. That's where the leverage is. And the problem in most of our programs are is they hit the top 20 or the bottom 15, where you have almost no leverage. Almost no leverage there. You are not going to make, I call them the unicorns. Harvard has 99% unicorns. Right? You've got 15 or 20, you're always going to have 15 or 20. You're not Harvard. Right? If you want to teach at Harvard, go teach at Harvard. Or it doesn't mean that academics have to be less here. It means we're going to have to have different systems and structures to have things help students get through. Um, but this, in the end, is about implementation. We're great. I've spent a lot of time in the last two years working with 23 colleges around the country on the ground in this cohort model. And I learned something even stronger that I already knew. We're great at talking about things. We have many systems set up to talk about things. Now, I think Long Beach has an interesting history on this. I know where I am, on the multiple measures side of this, of doing something major. Like, there's not a, I mean, you can talk to me about how, what parts of that went well or not well. But it was an attempt to do something at scale, which I applaud completely. And if it's not working perfectly, fine. It wasn't supposed to work perfectly the first time. Keep going. One of the things we also don't do is learn from what we do and make it better, right? We just go on to the next shiny thing. I'm very aware that Guided Pathways looks like the next shiny thing. I get it. It's one of the 20 questions, by the way, that's on there. By the way, I wanted to name Guided Pathways Divisified to the question strike back. <laughs> but other national experts talked me out of it. I don't know. Stifling my personality. Um, all right, let's get into this. Let's get into this. Uh, we did that. Get into the case for change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about economic mobility. And I don't have a lot of time to let this be interactive, but I'm very, I'm a social scientist, by the way, I'm very aware that higher education is about more than just economic mobility. A sense of lifelong learning, a sense of liberal arts outcomes like critical thinking, communication, computation, citizenship, creativity, global learners. I fundamentally believe higher education is about all of those things and more, right? I also believe in... Uh, Maslow's theory that if you don't have the basics covered, self-actualization and a sense of lifelong learning isn't going to get very far. I also want to ask you this question. What percentage of your students attend Long Beach solely for the love of learning? <laughs> By the way, why are you here? You love learning. I love learning. I would have nine PhDs if someone paid me to do it. I'd have one in like comparative religion and psychology. 
You know what? I definitely have one, in it, and I'm gonna know where I am now too. In civil engineering, so I could freaking understand traffic. Because <laughs> I don't get it. We don't want to want to go that slow. And I know it's about merging, and I get it. But there's, it's got to be more than that, right? We're gonna talk. Yeah. All right, later. We'll talk. Because <laughs> if I don't need the PhD and you can explain it to me, that'll save me three years and hundred thousand dollars. That'd be perfect. <laughs> But we know that not many students come here solely. Now, I don't think this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean at all we shouldn't try to catalyze a love of learning while they're here. Absolutely we should. That's not why they're here. Why are they here? As very famously, Sandy Shugart, the president of the uh, Valencia College, the first winner of the Aspen Prize, which I also am fortunate enough to work on, um, said, I have a single student at my college who wants to stay here. They're all here on the path to somewhere else. Back, let's be clear, the vast majority of your students, the research suggests between 80 and 85% of those students are trying to get a certificate of one year or more, an AA degree and directly enter the workforce in which we crazily call career technical, because they're all career oriented by the way, which is a false dichotomy we created. Thank you for the CTE faculty, you're like, I've been saying that. Um, <laughs> we're not on the CTE campus though, so I gotta be careful. Um, right? They're here for many other reasons, right? So I get off on tangents sometimes. But I'd argue 98% of your students are career focused. Now, this doesn't mean liberal arts aren't important. I could make a really strong argument that the liberal arts that we, caught, we talk about, those notions of critical thinking, computation, computation, are more important in 2018 than they were in 1968. And that's not just because of politics, although I could make that argument too, um, <laughs> that critical thinking is really important right now. And facts actually matter, but I got to I, see, I couldn't do that. I actually did that on Tuesday in Wisconsin. I knew exactly where I was. <laughs> Uh, like, I think what I actually said, believe what you will, but facts matter. Um, by the way, this room's a little more diverse than that room was. And let's be clear, that room's also trying to do great things for the students in their area who are all, you know, white. Um, look, well, on Aspen, by the way, we look at it and measure it. Like, if your population is 98% white and your college is 98% white, you're representing your population. Where you run into trouble is if your population is 40% Latino and your college is 80% white or 90% white, then you have a problem, right? I will point out, by the way, that we can't, we in California are better at this. We're not perfect. You know what the national percentage of faculty are that are white in this country, community colleges? 83. Yeah, so we have a mismatch even here. And by the way, it doesn't mean I'm white, by the way, I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> I'm a white guy who talks a lot openly about race and social justice. I'm gonna make the point in the middle that if we're not talking about it, no one will be. We can't marginalize this problem to only our administrators and faculties and students of color. We have to work together on it. It's the only way we're gonna solve problems. But the, the other reason that the liberal arts education is more important in 2018 is of course, because we're training people for careers that don't exist. The rapidity of change is much quicker than it was in 1968. So if I change from being an accountant to some new brand of like forensic robotics or something, I'm not bringing much from my accounting discipline with me. What I'm bringing with me in my liberal arts outcomes of being able to think critically, solve problems, be creative. That's what comes with me. And by the way, I don't have time for this rant either, but those of us in the social science and humanities, we have to stop pretending as if our disciplines exist in 2018 to keep themselves rolling as academic theory. If you want people to be a history major, convince them why being a history major prepares them to do something other than be a history teacher. Not that there's something wrong with being a history teacher. And if, by the way, I think every single one of you, philosophy, comparative religion, performing arts, all of us in the social sciences, could make the case of how what a degree in our area would do for you, even if you don't stay in this field. But we'd have to do that, because society and parents and accrediting think that we're wrong. And they've gone another direction. So why do you have 8 million pre-nursing students? Because society has told people that, I, I love you nursing people. I don't love, by the way, that you have 200 nursing people in your program and 3,000 people at the college who are pre-nursing, which means 2,800 aren't getting in and what do we actually do about that? But why do we have so many pre-nursing? Because it's about a career. Because there's a direct connection to what you're gonna do. I think we in the social science and humanities can, and for our very existence, are gonna need to do that. I look at my own field, psychology. I don't have one, I have a great problem here because 15% of American undergrads are psychology majors. Right? My problem is different. The problem is 0.4% of the workforce are psychologists who all require a master's or doctors. So that means most of the people, the vast majority of people who are a psych major are doing something else. 
I think we have a job trying to connect what we do for psych majors to that. So I don't want to in any way downplay the liberal arts. Um, but this is about economic mobility. And who's economic mobility most important to? The poor, right? I stand in front of you as someone who grew up in East San Jose in the lowest decile of parental income. And I, I was very fortunate. I was pretty good academically. I got into Stanford. I went nine straight years, four to Stanford, two to San Jose State for a master's, three to the University of Oregon for a doctorate taking Pell Grants and loans the entire way. I told you I'd love to get serial PhDs the rest of my life, but somewhere around sophomore year, as the loan balance was going up, I'm like, wow, this better pay off at some point. <laughs> By the way, I think I'm just now under my principal, so that's good. <laughs> 40. Oh, you laugh, you laugh. I mean, forbearance, other, you know how it is, right? right? And I loved learning. I was not a typical student. I was someone who actually loved the process of learning. But this is about economic mobility and about a family sustaining ways of being able to, to um, care for your family and also your community. Um, and there is, let's just be really clear, we're really comfortable talking about income, about socioeconomic status, as if somehow that's independent of race. Right? No, it's, we're talking about poverty. We're not talking about race. This is about low-income students. There is, by the way, I was just there, there is white rural poverty in this country. There's poverty amongst all the groups. Right? But if you think there's not a correlation here, ask yourself this question. Find me the zip code in this country where, on average, white citizens make less money than either African American or Latino citizens. Because that zip code does not exist. Right? It doesn't exist. So there is, this is highly correlated. And we need to talk about what it's like to be low income and of an underrepresented minority background than being low income and white. I'll tell you what happened when I was in high school in Northeast San Jose. My high school was very diverse. It, it was actually, and I use this term without any of the pejorative parts, where the boat people landed in the 70s in Northeast San Jose, right? We had Vietnamese, we had students coming in. Our, our, our district went from 0% Southeast Asian to 33 in three years, right? That's what happened. This is where they were. Piedmont Hills High School, Independence High School, Northeast San Jose, right? So my high school was like a third Southeast Asian, a third Latino, and a third white. And if you were a decent student and you were white, the counselors at the high school would tell you about Santa Clara, Stanford, Berkeley, USF. If you were a decent student and you were Latino, they told you about De Anza. Pause on that for a second. And it's still happening now, all across the state, even in this diverse state that we call California. We have to change expectations. We have to change the system so that that doesn't happen. And I actually think that Guided Pathways is a part of that. But we have to stop pretending that race isn't a part of it. And as I said earlier, we've got to work together to talk about this. And I say to the rest of us who are white, we have to be OK being uncomfortable talking about this, because it is uncomfortable. But if we look at this with a, with a problem-solving mentality, we've got a chance here. And I'm going to make the case that Guided Pathways is going to be one way. It's not a magic silver bullet. It's not one thing. It's a way of looking at things that are going to help us go forward. But let's take a look, by the way. So let's talk about the American dream for a second, right? You hear sometimes the American dream's dead in 2018. One measure of the American dream, the one we always hear, is, well, it doesn't matter where you're born. Everyone's got equal opportunity, right? It's a great hypothesis. Sounds good on paper. Um, <laughs> let's measure one measure of the American dream could be access to elite private education, going to somewhere like Harvard. So theoretically, if the American dream were valid in terms of that access, you would see, if you looked at Harvard's entering class, and you broke it down into income quintiles, top 20, second 20, third 20, fourth 20, fifth 20, you should see about 20% of the student from each of those quintiles, right? Doesn't matter where you started. You've got an equal chance. Now, this isn't Harvard's mission, by the way, but it's an exercise. And these researchers from those bastions of caring about the poor, Stanford, Brown, Harvard, MIT, and Cambridge, deep caring about the poor from those institutions. Um, even Berkeley, which I'll show you in a second. I don't want to piss off the Cal people. They get mad at me. Um, these are guys who are economists who study who goes to these institutions. Here's what they found when they looked at Harvard. So the top income quintile represents 70% of Harvard's entering students, and in fact, 15% are for the top 1% of income, which is more than almost the entire bottom three income quintiles. Again, not Harvard's mission. And by the way, Harvard works very well for those who get in from the bottom income quintiles. It took me a while being at a school that's similar to that in terms of selectivity. I was in the left half of that number one bar being at Stanford, which was awesome, by the way, because everyone else was talking about, I wonder where we're going to go on our summer abroad. And I was like sticking an upside down screwdriver into the carburetor of my 64 Dodge Dart, hoping I could get the engine to not flood so I could go to work. 
You guys have fun with Venice. That sounds great. <laughs> My other thing, favorite thing when I got there is, oh, you're from the Bay Area. You can show us all the cool stuff in San Francisco. I'm like, I've been there once. Right? That's good. I mean, I, I, mean, I went to a, aside from the baseball game in the zoo, I can, I've been to San Francisco once. We didn't shop at Nordstrom's a lot. It, was, it wasn't happening. Um, point is, right, this is not egalitarian access. If you add in, it's not just Harvard. If you add in the rest, I love this, the Ivy Plus. It's the rest of the Ivy League plus... Chicago, Stanford, MIT, and Duke, and I point out this random category they made up, might have something to do with the fact that two of the new four were researchers on the projects, which I thought was, oh look, we're the Ivy Plus now. Um, what do you see here? 15% of students are from the top 1%, which is actually more, actually the second slide I had to take out here, than the entire bottom 50%. So access is not egalitarian. We, and again, it wasn't Harvard's mission, I get that. But let's look at where the low-income students are. They're not at Harvard. Maybe they're at public flagships. I didn't pick Berkeley because I went to Stanford, the researchers did. This actually surprised me a little. Berkeley, public flagship, right? I would have expected a more egalitarian access by income. I was wrong. It's not quite as stark as Harvard, but it's still, this is not where you're seeing a lot of low-income students, right? Certainly not proportionally. Um, a place you do start seeing it is in the regional four years. The researchers picked one in New York. The SUNY system and the CSU system are usually said to be the best two regional systems in the country. Um, which I think is interesting. Anyone know what the graduation rate is from the CSU system in six years for native freshmen? It's a little higher now. It's gotten to 50%. For a long time, it was 47, 48. Right, that's one of the best systems in the country. So the regional four-year system, again, we start getting better access. But Stony Brook is one, by the way. And I bet if we looked at Cal State LA or Fullerton or Long Beach State, I bet Long Beach might be in between this and the blue bars because it's kind of an upper end I'm saying that. I guess I know where I am. So an upper end CSU. I don't know. I would be interesting to see. But where you see this is you start seeing egalitarian. Now, this is a particularly interesting college because it's halfway out Long Island where there are not a lot of poor people, but they've developed programs with the high schools in the Brooklyn and the Bronx to bring low-income students out. So it starts with a program in high school. They come out to Stony Brook. So it's not an accident that can pull people out to Long Island. But you know where all this is going. The researchers, where are most of the low-income students? They're us. The community colleges. This is Glendale up the road. And when I'm outside California, I have to explain to people, yeah, Glendale's not the poorest part of LA. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, get some movie studios. I mean, but, but think about that. This is the upper middle class. I mean, we, we know California, right? Where, no matter where you are, 300 yards away, there's a higher income and a lower income area. Um, there's certain parts that's not true. But um, for the most part, Glendale's upper middle class community. But where do all the low income students in that area go? They're much more likely to start at Glendale. So again, I look at this and I say two things. One, home run on access. We've done an amazing job with access to the community college system. And I look at this, but then I look at the problem. And the problem is that if you're gonna go from the red to the blue to the green to the yellow, you've just ranked graduation and completion rates from top to bottom. Now, I wanna be really clear. It's not that hard to get a 95% graduation rate if you have 99% unicorns who all have 1,500 on the SAT. Let's be really clear. I don't think this is because we've done anything wrong. This is structural. But if I'm a conspiracy theorist, and I can play one sometimes on TV, um, I'd look at this and go, hey, we are found a pretty good way to keep the rich rich and the poor poor. 95% success rate, public flagships, Berkeley's one of the best in the country on this. Between 75 and 92% completion rates, regionals vary between 30 and below 30% graduation rates to 60. Average community college rate, if you include one-year certificates and transfer and two-year degrees, is 35%. Okay, now, again, that's not a gotcha. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. But what I am saying from an economic mobility standpoint and a bridge out of intergenerational poverty, poverty, if we don't solve this problem, no one will. You know very well the CSUs who are great at doing lip service to things are not working on this problem, right? Good, some good people there. There's a couple of cases where that's, that's less true. But this problem is hard to solve. And whether you got into this for social justice and economic mobility or not, this problem is in front of us, and I know you all care about it. There's not a college in this country who doesn't tell me, by the way, when I do an Aspen Prize site visit or an interview, I do like hundreds of these every two years, of the phone interviews, I read applications, every single one of them who applies says, we here at fill-in-the-blank City College are 100% committed to student success. We all say it. If you ever get an Aspen Prize visit from me or from Josh Weiner, we'll both ask you the same question. We'll ask you, okay, cool, what's different for a student starting at your college in fall 2018 in their experience than for one who started in fall 2013. 
I actually think you have at least one very good answer to this question. Most colleges have almost no good answer to this question. So we're great at talking about how much we're committed to student success, but we have a 35 at the most percent completion rate, and we're not getting better in most cases. You guys, you guys are starting to, get to move up. And that begs the question, what are we doing about it? Again, I think this all comes back to at the end, what are we implementing at scale? I like to talk about guided pathways as capital C change. There's lower C change and capital C change. We are brilliant historically at doing lower C change for large groups of our students. Very small things. We change a practice and orientation. We add something. We do a lot of little things, process changes. We're also good at making big C change for really small numbers of students. Right? How many students at Long Beach? 20 some odd thousand? Right? We have lots of programs that serve 30 to 50. By the way, I love those programs. This is about those programs. Many of what those programs, Puente, Mesa, Trio, are doing are some of the tenets of guided pathways. Add all those programs up. What do you get to at Long Beach? Maybe 1,000 students. You got 25,000. Right? Big C for small numbers of students, large C for big numbers of students. You're going to do this not only for your financial reasons, but for the moral and ethical reasons. You need big C change to large numbers of students. It's the only way to make this done. And this, by the way, suggests to me this really matters, even maybe more than we thought it did. One more thing on this, just to close of the challenge, let's talk a little about race again. I love data. I could go into manipulation of statements. But here's a, I saw this in a report recently, and actually the researcher was trying to make the point about this data point, which is, hey, guess what? Great news. From 2013 to 16, the median net worth in this country increased 46% for Hispanic families, 29% for black families, and 17% for white families. You, as great stewards of data, want to ask what question? That sounds great, but where did they start? Well, I can do one better. Where did they finish after those increases? OK, let's look. Actual median net worth for white citizens after the increases was 171,000. For Hispanic and Latino citizens, it was 21,000. For African American citizens, it was 18,000. That's after the increases, right? So it, again, if you don't think race matters, just look at this slide. It does. And I'm not saying we're the reason this happened. That's not, we're not. In fact, we're the, one of the reasons that is going to fix this, if anyone's going to, or work on it. Don't mind that, sure. Um, but this is, this is what we're up against. And we're in California. By the way, there's not a lot of data on the Southeast Asian population. And we, at least in California, know the difference in the Asian populations when you look at outcomes between the classically Japanese, Chinese, and the Southeast Asian population. Not that they're good or bad, but their outcomes are different. Most parts of the country don't think about this because they don't have many Southeast Asians. Anyone know randomly where the most Southeast Asians are outside California? No, in Cal in, out in the US. Houston. Who knew? I, I, I was there one time when they're like, yeah, we have the second largest population of Vietnamese and Cambodian students in the country. I'm like, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> like, can someone explain that to me? Because I don't know how that happened. Anyway, all right, so we know the challenge is there. One other thing, now we're going to talk about your data pretty quickly. And just, so where does this come from? As the Guided Pathways movement started, we were, <laughs> this is a longer story, we had a lot of data points we were measuring. Ultimately, what do we care about? We don't only care about completion, we care about post-completion success, either in the workforce, ultimately, or in the transfer institution for our transfer students, right? And by the way, our goal should not be for Long Beach City students to transfer. Although that doesn't happen often enough, it should be that they transfer with junior standing in their major. And that, by the way, if you know the system very well, is a very important add-on. Because, by the way, the CSUs will accept nearly every unit you offer of a college-level course. But if I'm a transfer student, I don't care about that. What I want to know is how many of them did they apply to my major so I can complete in two years. And if we do nothing, we're, by the way, one of 47 states with bad transfer policy. There's only 46 others, so we have no good company. But it, it shouldn't matter, by the way, whether someone's transferring in psychology to Long Beach, Fullerton, or Dominguez Hills. They're all in the same system. But those three schools count very differently what, you, what they're going to take towards the major. We should work on that policy, but before that, we've got to do a better job of helping our students understand what they need to take here given where they want to transfer. You're going to tell me they don't know where they want to transfer. We're going to have to help them figure that out earlier. Right? So they're on the right path. Transfer's not easy. I get it. Um, so we needed a shorter set of indicators. Although I love transfer, I love completion, those are the things I care about. No one wants to hear what happened in your 2010 cohort. 
right? Ah, it's eight years ago. Everything's changed since then. Of course, if you look at the data year to year, nothing has been changing. But that's, I mean, the point is, if you're looking at old data, you're not going to want, you need one year metrics. And so CCRC and me and a couple others looked for some metrics that were predictive of the downstream success, and we found a couple. I want to point to the two that are starred. Those are the ones that I think are the most important because they're the most predictive. They're also, by the way, things you can move. We've got evidence from colleges that these are not static. There's big differences. The first set is college-level credit thresholds. By the way, if there's 60 units to an AA degree that are transferring, where should a student be at the end of the first year if they're perfectly on path? 30. I'll show you in a second how rarely that happens. Now, by the way, a lot of good reasons we don't have time to go into of why that happens. Part-time students, by the way, long dev ed sequences, low preparedness. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Not taking 15 units, a lot of good reasons. Um, but the thresholds are highly predictive, by the way. So these are important measures. We don't only measure 30 because it's depressing and hard to move. So we also measure 24 and 15. But before you get too wrapped up in what your number is, think about that for a second. 15 units after one year, 15 college level credits means they're one quarter of the way there if those credits are the right ones. The data point, we really want the data point that says what percentage of your program are you completed with? 50% at the end of the first year or 25, but we don't know what they're doing. Most times at a community college, it's comprehensive. So we can't measure what their program progress is. I hope we get to that point. We're nowhere near that now. Then we'll also look at some first term metrics, but the second one, and now I'm back in California, so whether you like it or not, this one's here. Um, gateway math and English completion in the first year. I mean, I think it's a lot of what your multiple measures approach was designed to increase, right? Um, this number matters. It's highly predictive of downstream success. Then the other one's fall to spring persistence. I actually hate this variable because it basically means you didn't kill anyone during the semester. They're still here. They might have failed everything, but they're still here, right? It's, it's a necessary thing for them to move forward, but certainly not sufficient. College level course pass rate's an interesting one. Um, just the theory here is if, yeah, okay, maybe they're taking 15 units, but they're only passing 40% of their courses. We got a problem that's structural at some level. I don't like the unit attempted one at all, so I don't include it. CCRC's got a research brief behind all these if you want them. But now I'm going to show you data from your college and four other local ones. I'm going to show you the California average and then the highest in the country, in the, in the state of California. You're going to want to compare. You're going to want to explain away. Just look at it and just know this is the baseline. This is out of state level unit record data. So this is hard to see, but I'm going to read you through it. I didn't know these would, these are cool screens, but they're about a football field away from many of us. Um, what you're seeing on the yellow there is Long Beach's numbers, then it's Cerritos, Cypress, Mount Sac, Pasadena. Good thing I'm farsighted. And California average is in the state high. So the state average uh, in California for six units in the first term is around 40%. You guys are pretty close to that. You're right around 36. The highest is 64. Go to 12 units in the first term. Now it drops. So this means that one in eight students who starts at Long Beach has 12 college level credits at the end of their first term. By the way, which would be 20% of the way toward the degree. So go to the year long data. On the far right, you see why we don't use 30 units. You can't read those numbers, they're low. The, lo the average statewide is five, you're at four. So, so you're either 20% lower or one point lower depending on your marketing spin. You know, <laughs> depends on how you wanna go with that. I'd go with the one point. We're not very good on that. We know some reasons why. The 24, the state average is around, I think it's 15, 13, and you're at 11. The state average, just pause on this for a second. The one on the left says that the percentage of students who enter community colleges in the state of California, it's the second bar in from the right, that have 15 or more college level credits accumulated at the end of the first year is 30%. Seven out of 10 students who start in our system are not one quarter of the way to finishing at the end of their first year. Right, Long Beach, you're right about that. You actually do fine on the unit thresholds. You're, all, you're right around the average. I mean, and again, I wanna say it's the absolute thing that matters more, right? Seven out of 10 is the number that's not making it. Math and English, I know this, this data, by the way, is from 15, 16. So I think this is maybe not hitting some of the stuff you guys have done in the last couple of years. But the percentage of students who are getting through college level math and college level English in year one is, you know, it's low around the state. You guys are right at the state average on math, around 10%. Woof, we're at 10%. That's, I mean, 90% of students aren't getting there. We know it's not, I'm not blaming anyone. This is not about math faculty. It's about systemic issues. None of this is about individual people doing things wrong. It may be that the system we're using is wrong, which is what I think AB705 is trying to do. On the left side, you see English. The average is usually a little higher at 25. You, by the way, have seen in the green bars that there are colleges who are moving the needle on all of these things. On this particular one, by the way, this data is a little old, 
There's a college in California down here, Cuyamaca in San Diego, who's gotten through COREC models ahead of AB705. COREC is where you go directly into college level math or English with a support structure around it. It doesn't, and by the way, a lot of this is about alternate math pal pathways, algebra versus statistics. I don't have time to go into that. But they're getting numbers in Cuyamaca at scale of over 60% on these two variables. Not 16, 60. So there is an upward moment here. And AB705 is a rough, I, by the way, I'm shocked that that happened in California. It not, it, we've had a very draconian kind of uh, implementation of something. Now, I do happen to think, by the way, that if we stick with this, it's going to really benefit students in the end. It's not going to benefit all of them. One of the common things people say about AB705 is, but there are students who are, this is not going to work for. Look at the numbers right there of the way we've been doing it historically. Right now, it's not working for most students. So the mo if the model doesn't work for 30% of the students the new way, I'll take 30 over 90 that it's not working for. And yes, if someone comes in with a fourth grade reading or writing level, the, neither the current system, the new system, or any system that I can think of that you could design at scale is really going to work that well there, aside from for a couple students who make their way through. But it's not like the current system serving it. I mean, don't be scared of the future there, because you can't make it worse than this, is what I like to say about this. You can't. Right? It's systemic. It's not math faculty or English faculty. We have some of the most creative math and English faculty all over the country trying to innovate on the margins of a broken system. This is not about math and English faculty. In fact, I think we need to give math and English faculty a lot of credit because for the last 15 years, we've been blaming them for the problem of completion. Right? The rest of us, psych faculty, so we get to sit back, classify, and say, hey, yeah, those math and English people can fix these structural problems. This would be, ah, we got it. That guided pathways isn't about dev ed math and English or basic skills as we call it in California. That is a thorny problem that we're wrestling with. This is much bigger than that. And it's not just about mapping your programs, it's much bigger than that, right? So finally, our math and English faculty gets up. And by the way, we also saddled them with having to fix all the other problems that our students come in with aside from the cognitive ones in math and English, like, I don't know, hope, confidence, perspective, persistence, social capital. I mean, we should ask them what they learn because they know a lot about it, right? <laughs> I mean, I know it's easy to interpret this as being critical of our math and English faculty. Quite the opposite from where I sit is they have been saddled. By the way, the rest of you who are going to see students, you know, this probably happened with you when you did multiple measures. You're going to see more students in transfer level courses earlier. You're going to become aware of the problems that the math and English faculty have had to wrestle with, right? I'm sure you've seen some of that already. So other things, this is the persistence rates, kind of all around 72%. You, always, you do have, and I know you guys are showing course success rates this afternoon. This is a little puzzling to me. I don't usually see, you can see there's not a lot of movement on this variable of term one college level course completion rate. I'd love to talk to some folks here. There is about a 10 point difference on this variable. This is very unusual. Like you can see the other Five colleges, they're all within one point. There is one outlier on the top end. The top end, I worry about grade inflation, but that's a whole other story. Um, this is not a variable that moves very much. So I think whatever strategies you're working on, and by the way, I think those strategies should be about faculty helping faculty, not evaluative, right? We need to know what the data is. We need to work together for solutions, right? Yeah, I mean, this is not, look, we, I bet there's a lot of innovation going on in this room that most of the rest of you don't know about. And he teaches a class, and we don't talk about what he does in that class, what works or what doesn't work. It was the promise of the SLO movement. Don't get me started on ACCJC. It's the same in other accrediting areas. That got screwed up. The promise of this, we get to focus on learning. How do we produce learning better, deeper? What's our approach? And then it turned into this deftly checkbox exercise of, I did SLO 3.2 in the fall semester, and I got a check in that box, right? Which, because that's what they made us do, right? Which was BS, frankly. And it's not what we actually tried to start that movement. Folks, great faculty around the state like Marcy Allen, Craig, and Janet folks were trying to help people with was authentic assessment of learning. But I do think this is an issue. So, and then finally, the graduation rate. I know the funding formula does this a different way. Um, when you look at the 150% graduation rate, which is the graduation rate of, in this case, back in the day, first time, full time students within three years. The state average is around 26, 27, 28%. Long Beach is around 19. 94th of the 115 colleges. The state high is at 62. Let's be clear, the state high is at my old college, um, Foothill. It's a lot easier to get a completion if most of your full-time students have 180,000 median income, right? By the way, I love my people at Friends at Foothill. They're great people. But the service area they draw from is very wealthy. 
By the way, the t a lot of the tops on these variables are colleges like Santa Monica, Moor Park, Diablo Valley, De Anza, Foothill, who draw from, so I don't, think, I don't know that some of the highs are stuff I'd immediately look to, because I love those colleges. I've worked at some of them. I've worked with some of them. I think what we've got to start looking at are places like Cuyamaca and Pasadena, who are making amazing increases in areas. Pasadena is a mix of, of populations as well. So this is the baseline of where you are now. When I look at all this data, and I want to tell you again for a second of why this is important in context, we talked about being the bridge out of, uh, about a, out of a, to a family sustaining wage. We talked about working under generational poverty, social justice, and equity. Here's where we are now. I want to make the case I was trying to make at the start. Don't do this work because of external reasons. Do it because you want to make a difference on these outcomes. And these are not charts. They're students, right? So what this means right now, let's just assume that this is right for, mo for most of you. So let's call it 20%. Eight out of 10 students who start here aren't reaching where they want to go in a time period that they would need to reach it. Translate into how many new students you have every year. Start doing the math on what if we got three more out of 10 students to get to where they want to go? How many new students a year here? It's got to be like four or 5,000, right? Call it 5,000. What is it, 6,000? 6,000. 6,000 new students. Let's say you have a 30% completion rate right now with those students. That means 1,800 of those 6,000 are getting through, and it means that 4,200 aren't. 4,200 students who are about to come through these doors at your current rate won't make it. The impact of the work you're going to do is not the funding formula. It's that if you go from 30 to 50, you pick up 1,200 more successes a year. Right? By the way, we have seen 20-point increases in this. 1,200 a year, do it over a decade, that's 12,000 citizens in your community who are reaching their goals. That is the impact of this work. Right? It's why I haven't talked about Guided Pathways yet, because if you don't believe that's why you're doing this, it's not going to be easy. It is not a recipe book. If someone's trying to I love Starfish. Starfish is not going to solve all of your Guided Pathways problems, even with a t-shirt staring me right in the face, right here. <laughs> Starfish is a great tool. Technology can be a tool to help move this forward. What needs to most change are structures, culture, and business process. The tool will help you, right? The tool is going to identify students at risk, give them nudges. What are you going to do about it? You're going to do. I, I could. I, by the way, your researcher always could. Have, I mean, Hetz when he was here, he could have given you. Here's 1,200 students at risk. Okay, now what? Right, early alerts great if you have a back end. Right, but that's why this work is so important. So, in my remaining two hours, I'm not even done with this yet. All right, it's good. Am I, am I like really close to being done? Maybe I should introduce guided pathways at some point. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> eh. I can tell more jokes. Hey, let's talk. I don't have a lot of time to go. We lose a lot of students to for-profits, right? Who disproportionately are the students we lose to for-profits? Low-income students and students of color are flocking to institutions that cost 10, in fact, in California, 15 to 20 times as much as it does to go here. Anyone know what University of Phoenix's graduation rate is? 18. Exactly the same as yours, actually. 18%. So students are flocking to institutions that cost 15 to 20 times as much for the same or lower success. Now, by the way, this is not to say there aren't good for-profit programs or good people who work at for-profit institutions, although I do have a moral and ethical problem with taking that much money for that low success. Now, I have, by the way, a new marketing slogan for you to try. I don't know who's in marketing here. Try this one. Fail with us, it's cheaper. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just too easy. They didn't like that in Wisconsin. I like you guys a lot better. Um, they really did not like that in rural Wisconsin. All right, but why does this matter so much? Why does it matter that we're losing people to for-profits? Because, wow, look at loan default rates, right? They're double at the for-profits. If you take loans, double the default rates, over 50%, but that's not even the bad news. The bad news is, well, the first piece of bad news is the second bullet. Because they're more expensive, you have to take loans more at a for-profit. So if you look at any hundred students starting at a for-profit, it's a three and a half times difference. Nearly half of students starting at a for-profit will default on their student loans. Pause there for a second. It's only 13% for us, but I mean, we have, we have issues to work on, but they're better off being with us. Why are they leaving us though? Why are they leaving us? Because they're promised a career, they're promised structure, they're promised support, they're promised they can do this quickly. We should learn. People say it's marketing, that's why they're leaving us. That's not why they're leaving us. 
They're leaving us because they've been promised a value proposition that we have failed at. We don't have the value. We say, come here and figure it out, right? Which is true, and we do that. We can help people figure it out. What do students want when you talk to them? They want to be directed and focused. Tell me what I need to take to get to where I want to go and help me figure out what that is. Every focus group I've ever seen on this, student support redefined in California, 1,000 students, Indiana, CBD, Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, they all show the same thing. Yes, there are some students who like wandering around, right? There are. There are some. It tends to be us, by the way, who end up in these positions. <laughs> Point that out. And, that's, and by the way, we're not saying everyone should be in a career program like dental hygiene or nursing or welding. We're not EMS. We're not saying that. We're saying let's structure the decisions that students make. They're going to have all the same decisions, all the same choices. You're not removing choices. You're architecting their choices. You're giving them an informed platform from what to make. How does this student choose a program here right now? Osmosis or because accounting is first, they choose accounting, right? My dad was an accountant. I love accounting. It's okay. Right? We're going to work on how do we give students the information, the experiences they need, not optional experiences because we know students don't do optional, right? How do we give them the experiences they need to make a decision about a program? Well, I guess they better explore what they like doing. And by the way, we're not going to lock them in. One of the things people say about pathways is, uh, I mean, well, once they're locked in, now they can't get out. They're not prisons, they're pathways, <laughs> right? You can change. And by the way, if we create an experience where a student learns they don't like allied health in their first semester, that's the best possible outcome we could have because it means it's not the sixth semester when there are five semesters of un unsuccessful momentum into this, right? Students are going to change their minds. We're going to help them. By the way, last data point on this, just if you want the most powerful data point I've seen in recent years, White students, not at for-profits, who complete have only a 4% loan default rate in their first 12 years. So what matters here? Completion, not at a for-profit. I don't think it matters when they're white. I think that's a structural problem. If you are black, you don't complete, and you start at a for-profit, you have a 67% loan default rate. That's incredible. So this, if you don't think completion matters, look at this slide. If you don't you can look at all the other data on what, what completion does in the marketplace, and by the way, I'm not kicking out one-year certificates at all, right? One-year certificates, by the way, are the shortest term investment for a student. The problem with one-year certificates is if they're not tied to future programs and advances, you're taking primarily low-income students and students of color, putting them in a place where you can get them a job quickly, get them some money now, and they don't have the next four or five steps after it, unless you do something to get them there or set up their getting them there. A8 certificate, lifetime earnings, is lower than AA, is lower than bachelor's, lower than master's, is lower than doctorate. I'm not saying everyone's going to do all those things, but we have to help people with this notion of a real career pathway. Certificates are great if they have market value, but there has to be a path past those. Now, bottom line for me is we have to be better for all of our students, but most importantly for those low-income and URM students, and I think we absolutely can do so. The big ideas of guided pathways. This is, you can't read this. Okay, those are the big ideas of guided pathways. Um, the right side, I'm going to tell you, clarify the paths. Help students know what they need to take to get to where they want to go. Get students on the path. What does that mean? It's a different onboarding experience. You heard Mike talking about this, right? A different onboarding experience. How do we help them pick a program? How do we give them an informed, positive, like what, think of how students came in historically. You guys worked on this. Historically, students who were already wondering if they were college material. Not sure college is for me. What's the first thing we do? Test them in the two subjects they hated most in high school <laughs> and tell them that, yeah, we also don't think you're college material. <laughs> Congratulations. That's not math and English faculty. That's the system. That's what we did. Right? Let's think about an onboard experience. Tell them you can do this, you will do this, and we're going to help you, and you're not going to have to ask for it. That's what this Guided Pathways movement is about. <laughs> How do we help them stay on path? Now, this is where I do think Starfish can be helpful as part of a process. How do we help them stay on path? When do we intervene, for example? How many students are in your nursing program here at Long Beach? How many a year? 480? 480 a year. Okay, how about five? That's big. One of the, about 480 a year? Okay, cool. I'm just going to say 200 because I didn't hear any of that. Um, let's say you have about <laughs> 200. 240, 170, 400, okay, whatever. It's some number that runs 200. How many of the students do you think are pre-nursing here? At... <laughs> all of them, by the way. That's my favorite response, but all of them are pre-nursing. 
this is not the nursing program's problem. It's our problem. And we talked about why they're pre-nursing, but the issue for number three, helping students stay on the path, things like starfish are great. What about intervening when we know someone's not getting in the nursing program? Is it moral and ethical to take tuition money from students who have a 2.3 GPA or seven semesters in? And by the way, if you ask them, hey, what are you doing here at Long Beach? I'm in the nursing program. Oh, what year are you in? Yeah, I'm still trying to get in. <laughs> What's your GPA? 2.3. You know if you actually had that conversation with a student, it would be morally and ethically reprehensible not to help guide that student, him or her, to maybe come talk to us about what maybe some other choices are. How much less morally and ethical a problem is it that we don't intervene knowing, I guarantee you, there are 800 to 2,000 students here at Long Beach right now who fit that profile. That is not the nursing program's problem. It's not necessarily the counselor's problem. It's our problem. How do we put things structurally in place? I can give you examples another time on those. There's examples, there's so much examples of all of these. What are the major transitions? I got a couple minutes. In mapping programs, hey, how do I pick programs? Well, I've got this alphabetical program list of 250 programs. That's one way I could pick programs. Maybe you should sometime try reading your catalog from where it starts listing your programs to where it stops. Tell me how useful that is as a choice mechanism. That's what students get. Maybe rather than that, we'll do something we call academic career communities, or you hear it called meta majors, where rather than when Mike comes in and he's got to choose from 240 programs, we ask Mike, hey, are you more interested in business or natural science or social science or humanities? Humanities, cool. Here's a first semester experience where you do a little bit of humanities, a little bit of gen ed, maybe we throw in a course that helps you learn more about the humanities programs. Go back to where I started. More about the humanities programs, and also, by the way, learn more about what those programs would do for you. I actually think we have a chance, those of you who consider yourselves in esoteric programs, to get more people into them if we architect a choice process, right? That's a whole different story. Mike can choose between, we're human, right? We can't choose between more than seven things. We get paralyzed. You guys ever been to the Cheesecake Factory? I mean, yeah. By the way, I was in industry when that happened, the research on the Cheesecake Factory the first couple of years, is everyone chose cheeseburger, pepperoni pizza, like they, all this choice was to you get paralyzed, right? Let's give our choice to students, let's give them six, seven choices, architect that process, and then make a second choice about programs. That's a much different way of coming into the college. Rather than choosing from long lists of a la carte courses, how about we actually give them program maps with default course sequences, not locked in, no one's ever going to say to Mike, Mike, we think you should take art history because you're a philosophy major. And Mike says, I hate art and I like music. I want to take music theory. Cool. Awesome. Now, maybe the schedule has been engineered so that art history was the course that would work for a student because I don't have time to go into how much of a mess your schedule is. <laughs> but try being a student sometime and putting together a schedule of courses. And by the way, let's say you magically are able to do that for the courses you think you need to take. Now it's the next semester and it's a whole different set of courses at different times. So I work half the time or full time. You, I, my first semester here, I had courses Tuesday, Thursday from 9 to 1. Hey, guess what? It's the second semester and I need to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 5. Well, I work. I mean, what am I going to tell my boss? Sorry, I can't do that, right? We wonder why a lot of our students, it's easy for, to drop out. So this is a big deal here, too. Algebra is the default math path to the idea of program-specific math tests. I don't have a lot of time on this one. There's a lot of research and energy on this one. We've got to convince our CSU partners to play. I think AB705 in the end will be a good thing. It's only going to work, by the way, if the CSUs get a similar AB that tell them to take statistics and quantitative reasoning as transfer-level courses in the majors. You also can't do this, by the way, unless you know what program they're in. You can't tell someone, no, algebra is not right for your program if you don't know what program they're in. Now, our default answer to that, by the way, is put all of them in algebra. The algebra sequence, which is the one they're least likely to need by all the research, right? So that's a big deal. The notion of like certificates and degrees versus degree pathways, I talked a little bit about that. Unclear connections to careers and transfer to really clear opportunities that have been specified. Um, we do lots of great job and transfer support for nearest completers. I'm going to get through these last ones to actually doing this at the start, helping someone figure out what are my career options? What are my transfer options at the start? Not when they come ask us, but as part of a process that all students get. Dr. Romali knows a lot about this from City College, obviously, of Chicago. Current semester program to schedule to a full program plan. College in Ohio in Cleveland, very urban uh, two-year college, has gone to full-year codes for students in a program. Enter one code, get classes for a year. That's cool. I know when my classes are this semester and next semester, and they've been programmed, by the way, so they all count towards what I'm trying to do. 
That's cool. It's not perfect there yet, but they're working on it. We do academic assessment. How about holistic assessment? How about actually thinking about things like confidence and productive persistence and hope and social capital and building it into the onboarding process? Um, we do a lot of prereq remediation. How about co-rec? Algebra and English being the only courses we ever talk about to the fact that you know there are critical courses in every program. Right? Whether it's A&P or microecon, there's hard courses in each program. Let's stop talking about it as if algebra and English are the only two and layer some services on these other courses as well. A la carte to a high school credit, I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but if we're going to do pathways with our high schools, they need to be program based, not just taking our chaos and pushing it down on the high schools, thinking that'll magically work. You fix our chaos, we're not doing it. Do it earlier. Right? Gotta, this has to be more program based. And then advising, we do a lot of stuff up front, that's cool. It's the only time we have them, we think we have to do it there. What about the idea of just a time support along the way? Telling me what's going to happen when I'm nine months in here and what I'm supposed to do then, not helpful. I need to know what am I doing now, how are you going to help me for what I'm doing now, and nine months, talk to me then about what I need to do. Just in time support for decisions, all the research suggests will work better. Scheduling we talked about, and let's be one quick thing on schedule. I know how we've scheduled for the last, well for you guys, nine decades. The dean or department chair comes in and says, all right, here's last fall's schedule. Anyone want to change anything? Uh, this fall, okay, cool. You want to go at eight? Oh, you guys can switch, that's good. Um, that's not set up for when students need to take courses. By the way, I was a dean, I know how this happened. That's not set up to have, to, how do I know what a student needs to take to get to where they want to go? I, by the way, you cannot start this work with scheduling. You'll drive yourself crazy, it has to come down the road. We talk all the time about full-time and part-time. Why not talk about whether students are on plan or off plan? And if they truly can only take nine units a semester, Let's get them a plan, because you know who needs Guided Pathways more? Part-time students. Because if they're taking courses, by the way, that are off their path, they're never getting out of here. <laughs> right? They need it more, not less. And let's stop pretending, by the way, that the data for part-time students eventually is okay. It's not. It is not the case that your graduation rate for students who are only part-time eventually catches up to your full-time rate. At most colleges, you're talking about a full-time completion rate near 50 and a part-time 10-year completion rate near 15. It is not the case that part-time eventually works out very often. It does work out. We have lots of stories where it does, but it doesn't work very often. So advising versus teaching. By the way, all, and I know I'm in California, so counselors versus teaching. Here they are faculty. Everyone advises. Your recruiting staff is advising, your counselors are advising, and boy, I hope faculty are advising, because A, I don't know the difference between being a forensic accountant and an actuary, if I'm an advisor. You know who does? I'm hoping the accounting faculty does, but that's the type of thing we're gonna need faculty to help with. I don't mean formal, but the other thing I know is faculty are with students about 200 times more often than student services is. Right? Even have best student services model in the country, I mean, Mesa, Trio, those are great. Maybe you see students 10, 15 hours a semester. They're 200 if they're full-time with faculty. So faculty need to be a part of this story. We've got to stop pretending, by the way, as if these pillars I'm talking about is, all right, mapping, that's faculty, there's no student services. Onboarding, that's student services and no faculty. Keeping students on the path, that's student services and no faculty. And teaching and learning, that's faculty and not student services. That's how we've acted before. There's sides of the fence, territory, turf. By the way, those pathways on the first pillar, if they're not aligned with what's going to count at the transfer institution, it can be, as some people have called it, a road to nowhere. I could design a great psychology program at my two-year college, which I think gives students the best two-year degree in psychology. If Long Beach State doesn't take four of those courses, is that really in the best interest of the student? Even though I think it's the most coherent program? I don't think so. You know what students love? Having to repeat courses. They love that. <laughs> they really do. Ask them. They say, I'm happy I'm only an academic sophomore now that I'm here at Long Beach State. Right? All right. Teaching and learning, it's the least developed of the pillars for a couple of reasons. And I would say the biggest one is not, even in states that don't have shared governance like California, has been a hesitancy to talk about what happens in the four walls of the classroom. You can tell I very much respect. I've taught and they're taught full-time, part-time. I respect what happens in the classroom, but I think we need to talk about it with each other, have true faculty-led teaching and learning academies, have onboarding experiences for new faculty so they actually learn about pedagogy and teaching because none of us learn that in our graduate programs unless it's in education, right? Let's talk to each other about this. Let's get better at what we do. Help us develop this pillar 
Because if this work happens, I think it's going to happen in a place like California, which has shared governance built in. Those are the big ideas. There's so much more behind this, including this slide, which is cool. But I have to finish. And I will say this. There are, there are resources for you. I run the California United Pathways Demonstration Project. Don't have time to go into the nuance between that. It's not the Chancellor's Office 150 million. It's actually a replication of a national pathways project. And it's an institute model. We're doing six institutes. Institute number four is in two weeks in September in San Francisco. There's 20 teams coming to these institutes, have been for a while. This, these two papers you heard about, Guided Pathways Demystified, they're not designed to convince you I'm right and you're wrong about Guided Pathways. They're actually questions that you're going to want to ask anyway that are being explored. There are questions like, there's a lot of funny things in there. What happened? What just happened? I had some good slides to delete. Oh, because I, I knew I wouldn't have time to do the questions. If you go to, well, I'm failing at the end here trying to get out of here. Someone throw this guy a life jacket. Um, he's channeling Jim Gaffigan there. It didn't work very well. All right, you'll see ncii-improve.com on there. You can download the two guided pathways to mystify papers. They're just like a page each on each of these questions. Like, hey, isn't free choice the cornerstone of American higher education? Or how do students make career decisions when they're 18 or 19? Or isn't all this hand-holding going to create graduates who can't navigate the real world? That's one of my favorite ones, by the way. We should be more like the DMV than less, because that's confusing. So we need to be confusing, too. Um, questions like, shouldn't we just ignore this like every other fa educational fad of the last 25 years? One of my favorite questions, by the way, because the people who ask that question have been right for 24 years. We talk about something new and something shiny every year. If you're going to do this, and I think we need to do it for our students, not because there's a project or any of those other external reasons, because of that intrinsic motivation of social justice and equity and economic mobility and getting students out of interracial poverty, you're going to have to stick with it. This is, you cannot assign guided pathways to someone, put them in a trailer at the back of the campus and say, you take care of this. Not that we've ever done that in California before with special programs. That never happens. But you can't do that. This has to be all of us working together. There's so much that comes after this. You're not at the starting line. The other thing is guided pathways is not a 180 degree or 90 degree shift. You get to take the great stuff you've learned from the other things you've done and integrate that. Those four big pillars, by the way, there's no cookbook anyone who tells you is, is lying to you. These are big ideas. This is a design and implementation process. You get to bring your expertise to this and help design solutions. But if we do nothing, we know what's going to happen. And if we subterfuge and kind of get into this but hope that the status quo is going to stay the same, you're going to have an 18% completion rate and it's going to stay where it is. We know you can change this. City College of Chicago has proved this. Georgia State, the colleges in, who've gone down some guided pathways front, we've seen movement on this. There's so much more resources out there. If you have questions, you can always email me at rob at ncii-improve.com. I'm usually in an airport or a hotel or a sports bar or a beer bar. <laughs> I've earned this, so I'm, I love being here. And I, was, I, I don't even want to get to where I was last night. All right, that's good. All right, I want to thank you guys for your time. I know it's, it's, uh, this is a lot. It's a fire hose, right? There's so much time for your inquiry and your questions, and I know that Dr. O'Malley and your team are great folks. I'm going to create those spaces for you to explore this and help design how to move forward. So thank you guys so much for your time today. <laughs>